Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Luca Pirans, and there is uh, Francesco with me. Today, we will uh, tell you about how we, um, we, told, we would like to share with you our experience uh, developed during the last years in finding and shaping uh, an architecture for uh, our apps. Uh, both from a technical point of view and also from a strategic point of view in the meaning of the, the, the decision that we took uh, with advantages and drawback. So we'll start saying why an architecture is needed for uh, writing better app. Then uh, we'll show you how to find uh, what your needs are and how to achieve it. Then uh, Francesco will uh, explain you the implementation detail and the technical stuff. And in the end, uh, we will see how we choose to distribute it. So let's start. <clears throat> First of all, some, uh, some of you may argue why I need uh, an architecture. In the end, uh, uh, the Android framework already give us uh, some structure to develop apps. Well, that's true. But uh, in my opinion, <clears throat> Android framework has uh, several limitations that uh, a good architecture can uh, easily help you to overcome. So some of them are, are this one. First of all, I think that layers are uh, not well separated. This means that uh, if we took an example, uh, the activity, we are forced to put all the UI stuff in uh, the activity class, but then we can add, uh, for example, uh, an async task to load data from DB or uh, network or whatever. And then uh, uh, the activity came, became both a uh, UI component and a business logic component. And uh, it's not easy to maintain uh, and test uh, components like this. So the consequence is not testable or it's very difficult to isolate component and to test it. And again, it's difficult to reuse code inside your application because the activity class or the fragment class is the same thing, can become very complicated and it's hard to reuse some pieces of them. So we decided that uh, we need an architecture to improve our uh, development. And uh, as a good developer, we went uh, on the web to look for a solution, of course. <laughs> Turns out that uh, there are a lot of architecture on the web. Uh, many of them are known by some acronyms, and um, <clears throat> like MVP, MVVM, et cetera, et cetera. And we found that some of them are pretty simple, but maybe are not flexible enough for our purpose, while other can be too much complicated and difficult to learn. So we, we went a bit confused and uh, we said how oh, we can choose the right architecture for us. So we did a step back and uh, to answer this question, we analyzed how our teams works and uh, what we really need from our architectures. This is a really important thing. It's better to fix the point be before starting to design and develop uh, your architecture. So we define this as our key values for us, and uh, they are interchangeability between team members, adaptability to different uh, app types and complexity, testability, and flexibility. Uh, I will explain uh, this in detail. So about interchangeability, uh, we are a team of uh, four or five people, and uh, we deliver an average of two or three apps per month. So some of them are really short app with short life cycle and low budget and strict deadline, while others are a big project that last for years maybe. Plus, of course, we still need to do bug fixing on app that we already have in production, or uh, sometimes uh, implements new feature on app on the store, or customers come back and want to change something. I know that probably most of you know this. So um, this means that most of the time, every team member works on different project. And we need that every, we decided our architecture should help us 
to define standard and to help our team members to move from one project to another easily. Then we decided that our architecture must be adaptable to all the apps we make and all the different projects that we make. This means the, the architecture um, must be adaptable to different apps with different purpose. And uh, for example, here we have a player app, kiosk app, font, we wearable, etc., etc. And we want a unique architecture that should be able to handle all these different types of apps. This is an advantage for us because uh, for our team members, it's easy to move from one project to another because you already know where the things are inside every project. So at a glance, you can easily find where to find UI component, uh, API stuff, DB, et cetera, et cetera. And this saves us uh, a lot of time. Then testability. Uh, I'm pretty sure the many of you know how important uh, tests are. So we define testability as a key value for our architecture. This means that it should be easy to isolate every component of our, uh, every layer of our architecture and uh, mock the component uh, below it and isolate and unit test it. So our architecture should help us to add test classes and isolate uh, components. And finally, we decide that our architecture should be flexible in a way that we can modify even its core if it's necessary for uh, some particular case. And this in particular influenced the choice that we made on how to ship it or how to apply it to all our projects. We'll see it in uh, detail later. So at this point, we defined uh, we, what we absolutely want from our architecture, and we went back on the web to look for a solution or for some uh, inspiration. But this time, unlike the first time, we had clear in our mind uh, what we need. So search our, uh, with a purpose, not like searching for architecture and, doesn't, it don't, and when you don't know what you need. So we do a lot of research. And uh, after our search, we found that this pattern or principle are um, very inspiring for us and very helpful for us. And they helped us to build our architecture. And I show what they are in the next slide. The solid principle, I'm pretty sure that many of you already have already heard about solid principles created by Robert C. Martin, uh, also known as Uncle Bob. But for who doesn't know it, I will briefly explain it. S stands for uh, Single Responsibility Principle, and in my opinion, is the most important of it all. And this means that every class should have a single responsibility. To res if you want to respect this principle, it's useful every time you write some code to think if you are writing the code in the right class. So just ask yourself, is this the class right for the logic that I'm writing? And this helps you to find the right place where write code. Then we have O that stands for open close principle. This means that software entities should be open for modification, no, I'm sorry, should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Then we have L, which stands for uh, List Code Substitution Principle, or LSP. This means that the object in a program should be replaceable with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of the program. HI stands for Interface Segregation Principle. This means that many client-specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. In other words, it's better to define many interface and avoid big interface to avoid to implement methods that you don't need in that place. It's easy, but it's a, a good thing to keep in mind this when you're developing. And finally, D stands for dependency inversion principle. And it has two key points. 
uh, abstraction should not depend upon details, and details should depend upon abstraction. So these are, uh, in my opinion, good principle, which is uh, good to follow to write uh, better and more maintainable code. And uh, keep in mind, uh, Uncle Bob is watching you while you write code, so <laughs> be careful. <laughs> then we look, uh, looked uh, deeply into MVP pattern, and we found it as is a really good choice for the UI, la UI layer of our uh, architecture. It clearly separates uh, the Android framework code from the standard Java code, and uh, so it tries uh, testability of your code and also reusability of code because components are well uh, separated. On the web, you can find tons of articles and interesting blog spot and documentation about MVP pattern. Uh, Francesco, in a few minutes, will show you how we implemented the uh, MVP pattern in our architecture. Again, uh, I'm quite sure that many of you know about the clean architecture, which is also made by Ro Uncle Bob, the guy before. Uh, <laughs> explain, it till, uh, explain it all in detail. We require too much time today. Uh, we won't uh, do that to save time for other things. But we were largely inspired by this architecture. The only thing we found is that it came, became a little bit overcomplicated, especially for uh, small apps or when you, have, mm, where you don't have too much time. I think, I think it's perfect if you work on the same product, product or project uh, for all the time, because it's easy to extend and modify and change things. But it can become a little bit complicated. So, what we did, we, we tried to simplify it a bit. But as you can see, Uncle Bob is uh, still happy with that. So <laughs> thanks, Bob. <laughs> and finally, I suggest you to check this repo. It's a collection of examples of the different architectural uh, approach, like MVP, MVM, and blah, blah, blah. And they are implemented also with different techniques. So. It's good, there are uh, a lot of examples, can be a good start point for uh, start writing uh, your own architecture. And also it's maintained by some Googlers and other experts developers, so things in there are consistent. Che check it out. After the documentation phase, we discussed uh, in our team on uh, a lot and on how to shape and design our architecture. We had a lot of brainstorming, and um, one thing that we found, and I want to tell you, is to be careful to not mix too much things together. Because maybe you like a feature from a pattern, another feature from another architecture, but you can't just put all the things together, or you will end up creating a monster that it's really hard to maintain. So. Planning is important, uh, you must be careful when you do it. Now I will, uh, Francesco will show you the technical details of our architecture. Okay, uh, hi everyone and good, uh, good afternoon. I am Francesco and I would like to describe you the choices that we made uh, to develop our architecture. We implemented it uh, inside a skeleton project that we use uh, to start uh, each Android app. After some months of work on it, this project is now stable enough, but we constantly update it with uh, new solutions that could make our life uh, easier. As Luca said, uh, uh, the main goal uh, of our architecture is to avoid this type of situations. <laughs> I think that each of us has felt like one of those men for example, developing on a legacy project, and this is not really good, especially near a deadline. This is bad not only for the mind for, the, for a developer, but uh, also for your company resources uh, optimization. Then we need an app where each component is uh, clearly defined and encapsulates a single responsibility as much as possible. We, uh, with the prospect to avoid uh, that one class can become a big ball of mud. 
the main dependencies of our project are uh, Rx Java, that uh, for those not familiar is an extension of traditional observer pattern, and it allows us to handle data in uh, a sync way using uh, observable sequences. There are uh, many samples online, and uh, even this year, some dedicated talks about it. Then we chose not to talk about it so much. Dagger 2 is the most famous uh, dependency injection framework, and uh, it allows us uh, mainly to decouple objects, keeping uh, them more testable, and give us uh, also more flexibility. Basically, we separate our code into layers, named uh, data and UI. UI layers have the purpose to capture user action and give him a feedback. The most of the time are reached with uh, data that come from the data layer. The data layer encapsulates all the stuff about uh, data retrieving and business logic. To achieve uh, this purpose, we use two quite famous design patterns. We chose to use uh, repository pattern for the data layer and MVP pattern for the UI layer. That is maybe the most common pattern in Android development. Global concept is that data layer gather data from one or multiple data sources and expose a final result to the UI layer that uh, manipulate and show it to the user. We can begin to analyze the lower le level layer, that is the data layer. It has uh, three basic elements, models, data sources, and repositories. Data source depends on one or more uh, model, and repository depends on one or more data sources. The most simple one, obviously, <laughs> is the model. Uh, it are uh, plain Java objects that contains uh, mainly the business rules that we need all across the project. They should be the least likely to change when something external change. That means that its implementation should not be affected by a change to navigation or security. A quite common logic uh, can be about uh, date parsing or object status changing. Data source is an object that collects models from a specific source, like uh, an API, uh, a database, or uh, an asset file, uh, and encapsulate uh, its implementation. Here, we must decide the working thread, and we do it with the help of uh, Rx Java schedulers. For example, uh, all database queries and network requests will run on IO thread. Uh, or if you have uh, another time-consuming task, it may run on the computation thread. Inside the data source, we can put also the logic related to the specific data collection mechanism, like a token generation function or a query builder. A repository encapsulates a set of objects persisted by in a data store and uh, the operations performed over them by one or, or more data sources. Every method inside a repository should use a logic to delegate specific data source to fetch data and exposing it to the client objects who subscribe to it. This class can contain also instance variables that work as uh, in-memory cache. This sample code describes, for example, a common situation in which uh, we get uh, a cached objects uh, if uh, them are already retrieved from a data source. Otherwise, we can execute an API request. This pattern should allow us to achieve an important goal, to keep specific framework or third parties implementation decoupled from the rest of code. Moreover, with Dagger, we can easily replace a specific implementation with another one with no changes inside client objects. For example, uh, if you want to replace our ORM Lite with a new Realm implementation, we need only to change a line 
inside our Dagger module and nothing more. Then, for a quick recap, here we have a simple schema that summarizes our three elements, models, data source, and repository. You must, you must keep always in mind that this is only a basic schema, and these are the objects that we use in the most of the situations, but uh, you may need to add more elements to this diagram. We talked about data, but now I want to show you uh, how it are displayed to the user. As I said before, we use MVP pattern to implement the UI layer. This pattern contains three element, model, view, presenter. We chose to use the same model defined inside the data layer directly because it is the most of the times equivalent to it. And we want to avoid unnecessary class proliferation. For this reason, model is missing in this schema. We can start to talk about the most simple element, that is the view. Uh, it is usually implemented by an activity or a fragment, and it will be responsible for creating the presenter. We don't explicitly create a new presenter instance, but we ask Dagger for help. The only thing that the view will do is calling a presenter method uh, each time a user action or Android callback occurs. Almost uh, every fragment that we implement forward the onViewCreated method. Then the view passes control the, to the presenter. The presenter is the most complex class in our architecture because it interacts with many objects. Its main task is to retrieve data from one or multiple repositories and returns it to the view. Unlike the typical MVC, it also decides what happens when you interact with the view. For example, inside view created, uh, we may call get task from our repository and subscribe to observable return. We will do the same thing when a user trigger an action like a save or a submit action. To subscribe to an observable, we need a subscriber. That is a remake of Java Observer that we must create a new instance of this one. And as many of you know, a subscriber contains three methods. Or next is called every time there is an update inside the observable. Then it can be called zero or more, ta or more times. On error is called, obviously, when an error occurs inside the stream. Then it can be called just, just one time. On complete, at least it's called when the observable has finished sending updates, then uh, even it can be called just one time. Presenter doesn't know the real view implementation, then it allows us to isolate Android framework, as Lucas said, from the presenter logic that can be tested more easily with uh, only JUnit. Dagger, uh, even here, come to the rescue. And this schema is uh, really similar to the, the, the layer one. Uh, as I said before, we use Docker to decouple, presenter, and view implementation. Uh, when the view is created, it will request its presenter to Docker module, which, uh, like a factory, work behind the scenes providing a presenter implementation. After that, the view will attach itself to the presenter, which cares nothing about uh, the real view implementation. All we have seen uh, is very nice, but uh, as we all know, real problems working with uh, Android SDK are quite different. The common problems that we face every day are mainly these three. Uh, resume pause that occurs when uh, there is a running request because it can finish uh, when the app is in pause and we don't want to lose its result or update the view when it is not active. Orientation change is quite similar to resume pause, but we must pay attention that activity is recreated, and then we lose our instance variables. Show a loader, we must understand if we need to show a loader to the user when a long-term request is running 
or if it is, or if it is not needed because we have already cached the result inside the repository. In addition, these problems are not independent from each other, but them can occur at the same time. For example, we may need to show a loader after that the user has rotated his device. So keep call and find a solution. Uh, solution for these problems can be multiple, and now I'll describe you how we chosen to resolve them. For a clearer explanation, uh, we can look at it from the user's perspective. Let's start to look uh, at a common use case. Uh, your activity starts and the user waiting for a response. Before the request can be completed, user can put uh, the app in the background uh, through the home button. The request ends and the app is still stopped. Then, uh, especially if the device has uh, low memory, the system may have killed your activity. We solve this problem using an RX Java operator called Cache. And it allows us to remember items emitted by um, unobservable, uh, even when there are no more subscriptions. Um, emit them to future subscribers. That means that the request will finish and the observable will save the response. That will be handled on the next on resume. Obviously, this mechanism work also on orientation change, but in that case, uh, uh, we need to consider that the activity is destroyed. Then we lose our instance variables uh, like uh, m task request and m subscription. To describe orientation chain problem, uh, change problem, we can start from the same situation as seen before, where uh, a request is uh, ex executed uh, and the user waits for a response. While the user waiting, uh, he may choose to rotate his device uh, because he wants to see the content uh, in a landscape mode. Then activity is destroyed and uh, recreated by the system. Then we lose uh, our instance variables saved inside the presenter. So we need a place where we can put all our variables. An option is to use the instance state, but if you have a lot of variables, uh, maybe tedious to save and restore each of them. So we looked for a new solution. And we create a singleton object that save and restore our presenters with the help of uh, uh, Guava. But basically, we save inside the instance state only one integer that uh, identify our presenter inside a map that is cached by Guava. It allows us to retrieve a presenter after activity recreation, and it will, will be, we will find the variables uh, as we left. Save and restore are handled uh, inside the Dagger module automatically, <laughs> so we can forget to handle it. In the last, we need to know when loader must be shown to the user. For example, we, may, we might be reading a mail, and now this is cached inside our repository. We go back to the list, but uh, after a few seconds, we want to read again the same mail. We will see a loader flickering because data is retrieved almost uh, instantly from the repository. In fact, presenter does know nothing about uh, repository cache. Then uh, it can be decide if loader must be showed or, or not. Also in that case, the solution comes from a uh, Rx Java operator named the bounce. Inside uh, a presenter, we apply this transformation to each observable that execute a, re a request to the data layer. This allows us to start every observable with an empty object called model wrapper. And the bounce will ignore it uh, if our data request complete in less than, uh, than uh, 150 milliseconds. Otherwise, the wrapper goes forward in the chain and will be handled by this one next that will show the loader. In all cases, we will hide loader when a request terminates both with 
success or an error. In the end, a filter operator makes sure that our fake wrapper doesn't go ahead in the chain. So as final recap, we discussed about the libraries that we must learn to build and better understand our architecture, the layers of our architecture uh, that are the data layer and the UI layer, and how we handle common Android development problems as a recent pause, orientation change, and loader handling. Then I give the floor to Luca. Thanks, Francesco. OK, so at this point, we think, talked about our architecture. We designed it, and we developed it. And then we faced uh, one last uh, problem, how to use it, how to distribute it, uh, it uh, inside our team. Uh, so to take this decision, we evaluate two different approach. One is using archive, AIR or uh, JAR, and the other was using uh, template. We evaluated the uh, advantages and drawbacks of both these methods. So for example, with uh, an archive, is uh, really easy. If you find a bug in uh, your architecture or base class, you can easily fix it and then just uh, build uh, a new version of uh, your JAR or EER and update uh, the dependency in all your project and you have the fix in all your projects. While in the other side, if you, j if you use a skeleton or template, you probably need to do manual fix if you find a bug and this, is, this can be annoying. But in the other side, if you need to modify source for a, a particular case, if you use a template, it's uh, easier. I mean, uh, you have the source code, uh, all, your, all the source code inside your project, so you can change uh, whatever you like. While uh, if you want to do the same with uh, an archive, you probably need to create a new version of the archive. Maybe you need uh, this modification only for a particular case, so you don't want to change the base code of your archive. You are probably going to, to branch the repository and create a special, a special archive for that case. And again, what I often happen uh, to us is the, our customer uh, buy all the source code of our uh, projects or apps. So in this case, they obviously want to have uh, access to all the source code. And uh, if you use a template, this is already done. I mean, all the source code is inside your project, so you can give uh, Git access to them, and then they have, they have uh, all they need. While on the other side, it's more complex. I mean, or you give access to your base uh, architecture repository, or you, when you ship it, uh, you have to change from the archive to the current version of the source code, or, um, or Another option is to, if you have your architecture open source, you ju can just say, okay, you have the repository, go there and watch what you like. But, so all these things are different. In the end, for the moment, we choose to use uh, a template. But I know that this can be different for uh, different teams. It really depends on how you work and what are your needs. We are doing like this, like since, one year, and so far, everything is going good. So regarding this, if you are, if you are interested on how to build a template using uh, Android Studio plugin, I suggest to follow the next talk, which is uh, held uh, by my colleagues Andrea and Adam. And they will uh, show you how to create uh, Android Studio plugin and specifically how to create plugins to make uh, code templates. So if you're interested, don't miss it. Before closing, I just want to say a few words about uh, the old apps, what to do, what legacy code that you have when you finish the, your architecture. And uh, the question is, migrate or not to migrate the code, no? So, at the moment, we choose to evaluate the migration of code case by case. I mean that, uh, for instance, if we need to do a bug fix uh, on a old app, and we know that this app will be this, we probably just do the fix and don't migrate the code. 
On the other side, if we have the perception that the app uh, will be upgraded and will have a long life cycle and our planned new version of the apps, we try to migrate it, but migrated uh, requires a lot of effort because uh, other than refactor effort, uh, you, knew, you need to do all the tests again because the regression uh, is uh, easily to happen. So even if your app is in production, you risk that you migrate to the new architecture and then you have bug that you haven't uh, before. So it's a really risk and it's not easy to explain customer that <laughs> there are new bugs. So that's a problem. So concluding, uh, we worked on this architecture in the past year, and uh, we still try to improve it and um, to refine it. But uh, I, uh, we not said that mm, since we use it, our code is uh, cleaner, it's easier to maintain. And uh, also, we noticed said that once the, all the team members have learned how to use the new architecture, our productivity increased a lot. So we think we are on uh, a good path. We hope that uh, what we said can be useful to you. And uh, feel free to keep in touch with us if you want to share your experience or uh, whatever, ask something. We are around here for today and tomorrow. So thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank.